my name is Victoria. I am a magic and mindset mentor. I help women with mental health stuff, depression, anxiety, PTSD, etc. cetera, um, use magic and meditation and focus on their mental health and um, trauma. I've been doing a series of videos um, with different women who also have businesses um, or projects that they're working on um, and just interviewing them to learn more about um, their mental health. Um, so today on the show, I've got Taylor Doyle. Um, she is a blogger and mental health advocate. Um, I recently just connected with her. Um, so Taylor, tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Um, well, I have experienced a lot of mental health issues and I, I decided that I, it, it actually started recently, my blog, mm -hmm. um, because I was diagnosed with an eating disorder this past year along with borderline personality disorder. And when I was diagnosed with BPD, I was, I was almost afraid because I knew that there was such a huge stigma attached mm -hmm. to it. I thought to myself, how can I decrease the stigma so the next person in my shoes doesn't have to feel the way I do right now? Yeah. It doesn't have to feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know anybody with this. I don't, I don't understand you know, what I'm going through or why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to really create this blog to form unity in the mental health community um, to make everyone aware that it is okay, <laughs> that it is, you know, something that you may not be able to quote unquote get over, but you can live with it yeah. and you can still have a great life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and how old are you? I'm 18. That's awesome. That's really amazing that you're so young and doing this amazing, incredible advocacy work. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So you said you were just recently diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, right? Right. So what, what has that process been like? Um, what led you up to, to that point when you started seeking professional help? Well, I, my parents divorced at a very young age. Um, and since then, my mom always thought, you know, I want to get her, her being me in therapy. So that way I had someone outside of the family that I could talk to and confide in. And I, I didn't have to feel like I was taking sides. You know, I didn't have to feel like, you know, I was bad mouthing my dad to my mom or my mom to my dad, just kind of like a neutral party. Right. So in therapy since I was seven and, you know, a lot of, um, unfortunately tragic things had happened in my life that had kind of kept me to where I needed therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until recently that they had realized that I'd had borderline because it was something that, because I also have depression and anxiety, generalized anxiety, um, post-traumatic stress, etc. And they thought that my emotions, they thought that my mood swings were like a, this combination of hormones along with my other diagnoses. They didn't realize mm -hmm. that it was something different. Right. So I had a bit of a meltdown where it was something small, like a text message, not even like a hurtful one, just something had triggered me. And I was just crying and I ended up going to the hospital and it was just, it was something where they were like, no, this is a separate issue and mm -hmm. you need to get help. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, absolutely. So what does that help look like that you're getting? Well, I'm actually starting my first day of that treatment today. It's okay. a PP, so I will have more information on that. Um, obviously, after today, it's um, more for the eating disorder, but it also helps um, with coping skills for the borderline. So mm -hmm. lots of DBT, lots of therapies and groups and, you know, meal conscious and, you know, kind of learning to live with my impulses and mm -hmm think, is this what I want or is this what this is telling me that I want? Yeah, absolutely. I did hear that you had a use of DBT, so I get it. Um, I was actually uh, in DBT therapy for several years because of my self-injury. Um, right. Because I started when I was very young, I was seven. Um, so I've done class. It's definitely very helpful. Have you done it before? I have. Um, when I first came out about my abuse, I was um, I was put in trauma therapy, and my trauma therapist thought DBT would be a really great skill um, for me to master. So I was actually put in a parent and teen DBT group. Okay. Um, so 
my mom would come with me and we would sit and we would learn DBT skills. So she would learn how to live with my, my issues and how to, you know, treat me the best that she could. And I would, I would learn how to, you know, it it was life skills, I guess you could say. I feel like now I'm like a DBT obsessed person and I feel like I've learned DBT because it's like that important life lesson that they don't teach you in school. Right. You know, I feel like there should be like a DBT class everywhere. I'm so obsessed with it. But, um, yeah, so I did have that experience. And then when I was in my eating disorder program, um, this past year, we also did a lot of, um, DBT incorporated, uh, groups and things. Mm-hmm. So it's been a uh, role in my, you know, recovery. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, and so for yeah. those who don't, who don't know, um, DBT is dialectical behavior therapy. It's dialectical, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's been a little bit. That's um, okay. And so basically what it is, is it helps you literally rewire your brain, right? So it helps you like look at your, ch- I remember doing these really extensive worksheets and having just binders of like the same worksheet <laughs> um, because like the entire point of DBT is to stop and be aware of your triggers and then work through that process instead of going through a, an impulse, right? Mm -hmm. so what are some of your coping skills that you're actively using a huge coping skill that I had developed my freshman year of high school was I write poetry okay and back then I used to write and perform poetry um thank you a new skill that I had acquired was painting um when I would get these when I would get these feelings or urges or impulses or what have you I would think, well, what does it feel like? Mm-hmm. You know, it's always like my, my thought process. And then I thought it feels like, like hands around my neck. And then I, I would draw like hands around my neck and it would mm-hmm. just, it would help me visualize and kind of say like, I feel like this or, and, and that really helped me throughout therapy. Um, I, I was very creative in the ways that I expressed myself, um, especially in eating disorder therapy, learning that there were healthy ways to express myself mm-hmm. and, that there were ways that I could articulate what I was feeling and that didn't, you know, involve some sort of destruction. And I think that's a really important message to convey is that there are ways. Um, I know a friend of mine, excuse me. Oh, and I just went to yoga. You're fine. Great. I'm going later today. So. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Awesome. I loved it. So that's something I'd like to pursue, but I journal quite frequently and Mm -hmm. I feel like that helps me a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Journaling has been one of my my own coping skills, and I've gosh, I've had a journal since I was probably like nine. Wow. Um, cool. Yeah, I actually, and I have a funny story about it because what I used to do is I used to save all of my journals, and so by the time I was, you know what, I was about eighteen or nineteen, I had an entire uh, steamer trunk full of these old journals, right? And they were like old journals of like when my parents were like getting divorced, like ongoing trauma and abuse. Like there were journals from when like I um, dated a sociopath who's now like in prison for murder. Um, So like tons and tons and tons of trauma and emotions in all these notebooks. And I had them in a big steamer trunk. And after I had my son, one of my friends was like Victoria. You realize (laughs) That is like the most literal way to carry your baggage around ever, right? Right. And I'm like, you know, I never, I never really thought about it because like for me, like journaling was such that relief and I liked to be able to like go back and look at how I had improved. But what I found is when I did that, a lot of it was really just triggering for me. So mm-hmm. Do you, what I ended up doing is taking the entire steamer trunk and I had a bonfire um, and I, I burned everything. Um, and it was, it was, it was really difficult because it was like, that's like 12 years of trauma. Um, right. so what do you do with your journals when you're done? I, like, for me, I, this is, oh, it's Wendy. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're fine. Journal that I have started and that I and so the way I look at it is like it's a little piece of artwork. So I'll draw in it and I'll, you know, tape things into it or like ticket stubs from a night yeah. that I'm 
things like that. And I always, like, I can have such negative entries, but I feel like a part of me thinks that it's so important that no matter how bad the entry may be or how, like, oh, my God, this was the worst day ever, I would want to say, well, make a list of good things that happened that day, even yeah. if they were so I can kind of try to find that beauty in the everyday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like it sort of like prevents me from getting too low. Um, and I think I'd like to keep it. I mean, I think that it's an important way to see how far that I've come mm -hmm. because I, and actually I wrote in a journal entry because I was a freshman in college before I had to medically withdraw. Um, I wrote how different I was from my freshman year in high school. Mm -hmm. and how I wanted everyone to like me and how I wanted to be that girl. And I'm my own person and I have to be that person and I have to own that person and I have to like th that person because I'm stuck with her wherever I go. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, yeah, in terms of the journals, I really think that it's, it's awesome to keep your life in a history book. Mm -hmm. Like that's how I think of it. So I think I'm going to keep them. I think I'm going to yeah. hold on to them and say that, you know, this is where I've been, but I don't have to be there anymore, that girl anymore. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one thing, one thing that's really changed from like my journaling then and my journaling now, my journaling now is very like solution based. Like you said, like all of my entries, I end them with like gratitude lists or affirmations or mantras or like how to take care of myself that day or what I'm going to do to take care of myself that day. Um, and, and I think that's why I got rid of the ones that I did because I didn't have solutions at that point. Um, I was in and out of therapy, but I was still actively self injuring. I was still actively using hard drugs. I was still, you know, completely acting out. And so right. I think that looking at my journals in active addiction and trauma as opposed to like the other side of the road now I think that's a really really beautiful thing and, and a very important thing to recognize right I think it's really important that you realize that this is a part of you but it's not the whole thing yeah absolutely like we are high-dimensional people and I feel like it happens a lot in the community where people are like, oh my gosh, she has like, for example, borderline personality disorder. She's mm -hmm. crazy. Is this, that, and the other thing? Well, I'm someone's daughter, you know, I'm someone's sister. I'm a person. And I feel yeah. like if we just stripped ourselves and each other of the labels and we saw just who the person was and we saw what they had to offer the world, I think it, we would just be living in such a different place. Yeah, absolutely. That's so beautiful the way that you put that. So really honoring, you're talking about honoring a person's value, not just what they do. Right. I mean, I believe, and you know, maybe this is just an odd belief of mine, that there are three beings in all of us. There's the okay. person we were, the person we are, and the person we're working to become. Mm, that's beautiful. And those, and those three people may not ever meet each other. I, I picture my body like a building and like these people are moving in and out of me and I get to watch, you know, and I think it's such a beautiful thing that we just get to, I have this opportunity to see myself grow because right. at the end of the day, I am my most long and outstanding commitment. Mm -hmm. And I just, I have to love myself. And as hard as that may be, I mean, I've done Facebook live videos, um, about mental health and things. And one of the comments was, how do you get over your depression? And I was like, <laughs> I, I, I've never gotten over it. I mean, yeah. my, I was first um, like extremely depressed when I was nine and my grandmother passed away and I felt like she was the glue that held the family together, mm -hmm. you know? And then I lost my aunt um, five, five years ago yesterday she took her life and then four months later my uncle did the same thing and then I lost my dad to you know drugs and alcohol and I'm not over it I'm through it you know what I mean I'm I'm still living with it I'm still coping with it I'm still saying you know I may not I, I try to look for the gains in my losses mm -hmm. where before yeah. I couldn't do that yeah I couldn't say like I broke up with this guy that I I really cared about but I also gained a best friend. You know, I, I couldn't think like that before. And I think it's really important, like with DBT skills and so many other things that we can kind of take the picture and put it somewhere else on the wall or maybe put it in a different frame. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Your, your analogies are really beautiful. I, I like that a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so you said that you paint too, right? Yeah. So, okay, I've used painting as a coping skill as well too. Now, did you kind of paint um, or do you just kind of um, paint whatever? Um, a mix of both. I have a few friends that paint and we kind of just compare with each other and I'll say, hey, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? But mostly, it's, oh, it's just my... It's just my expression. I try not to get too many opinions. I try not to um, censor myself or filter myself because that's that's not as authentic as it could be. Yeah. Now, what would you say to someone who wants to use painting as a coping skill but doesn't think they can paint, like at all? You'll never know if you don't do it. I mean, I know that's really cliche, um, but I really think that by saying you can't do it, you're already not doing it, mm. you know? And I feel like, if it's something you want to do, what's in your way and why? Yeah. I mean, for me, when I first started, and even this is an issue that I still have is, oh my God, like, what if I mess up? Then you start over or you fix it or you paint over it. You right. know, I would have this issue because I thought everything was so permanent. Mm -hmm. You know, oh my gosh, if I just mess up this one thing, this whole picture is going to be ruined. Well, now I've kind of done this thing where if I want to do something, I'll do it and I'll keep going with the mistakes and I'll collect all of the mistakes and go, well, how can I fix them next time? And I think it's all mindset. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. Especially something creative like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely all about mindset. It's how you approach it. Um, Cause like for me personally, I get like anxious when I sit down to paint, even though I enjoy it because I have such that perfectionist quality. Um, mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about painting is um, the whole art therapy aspect of it. So I don't know if you know this or not. Um, I took an art therapy class in college where it was part um, psychology and part art class. So um, once a week we would work on art projects that like were parts of art therapy and then the rest like the other class of the week would be on the psychology of it. So one of the things that I learned is that different mediums can trigger different trauma. Um, and, and what I found for me going through this art therapy class, they had us do art therapy assignments. And it was extremely difficult for me because of all of the, the trauma that I had been through and all of my mental health stuff. Um, and so I remember painting and being extremely, extremely triggered because one of the theories in art therapy is paint, it's very fluid, right? Um, so it's very, it's very fluid, it's not constructed. Um, and what, it, what happens for a lot of people when they're tuned in is sometimes painting can trigger um, like sexual trauma. Whereas um, uh, tactile mediums, so like, clay, pottery, um, like metalwork, basically anything like extremely tactile with your hands. Um, what that does is it can trigger and heal um, like physical violence. So like physical abuse or domestic abuse. Um, wow. so it's just this really, really, really interesting concept that different mediums help different things. And so for me, um, I would I would paint and cry. <laughs> I would paint and cry a lot. And I didn't even want to paint at first because I knew I, we learned that what it would trigger first before we actually did it. So I had all of this anxiety, but I found that like over the past two years, um, it's become very freeing for me because mm -hmm. with, with paint, like you can make a mistake, but you can fix it very, very easily. Right. I'm sorry. Oh, I just said, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I actually didn't really realize that there were so many theories behind it. And I think that's really interesting, something that I'll personally look into. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just taking that in. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it was, it was definitely mind-blowing for me. Um, oh. because, 
I, I knew that art and creativity and expression obviously are like giant, giant, giant coping skills that help. But I never really thought about how doing different things with your body triggers different things in your brain. Right. Um, it reminds me a lot of EMDR too. The, um, I, the rapid eye movement therapy. Right. Are you familiar? I've heard. Yeah. So it just reminds me of that a little bit. Right. Um, a lot, one skill that I, I acquired at a very young age was writing. Mm -hmm. And I, I did that because when things wouldn't work out the way I wanted them to, I could write a new ending. Mm -hmm. You know, I could write how the story played out. Or if somebody said something I didn't like in my story, I could change it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would write things and it, it started off as like little, you know, I would write about being a mermaid because I just wanted to be so free. And I remember, mm -hmm. you know, when I was about eight or nine years old, all my stories would be about mermaids because I wanted to feel like I could breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to feel like I could just swim away from all of my issues. And um, later on, it, it, it became my way of telling my truth. Mm -hmm. And it became this way of it became like a challenge. Like I was given 26 letters in the English language. How can I put them together to express this? Right. How can I convey this with, you know, in this format or in this method? And it's so interesting because it just, it's so liberating, but it's such a challenge. And I feel like that's what I like about it. Yeah. Is that it, it challenges the way I think. And how people are always kind of like, oh, this writer, this writer. And that's how I got into spoken word. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely my favorite, um, I guess you could say, poetic medium um, is spoken word because it you feel it right away. Yeah. I feel like it's an instant form of communication. Where, like painting, for example, I love it, but I feel like you could just take it so many ways where if I'm, if I'm talking to you and I'm looking at you and I'm reading you a poem, there's no other way you can take it. Yeah, absolutely absolutely it's very um it's it's very connecting I've done slam poetry open mics and and they're like there's a kind of connection in those poetry slams that doesn't really happen many other places oh I agree it's it's very vulnerable very very vulnerable mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about your blog I know you just started it. What are you right. what are you wanting to do with it? Tell me all about it. Well, the idea of blogging stemmed from an idea that I had for a comic originally. Okay. And it's it's something that I'd really like to pursue. It's a com it's a comic of a superhero with mental illness. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I the way I wrote it down in my journal when I was originally plotting this was to bring out the Clark Kent in every Superman and to praise that. Because there is strength in um, getting out of bed. There is strength in doing these little things that people are like, you can't do that because you're depressed or you can't do that because of this. Like, that's so silly. Um, and it's kind of like praising that and saying, you know, this, the superhero may not win every, every battle, but she'll win the war. And that's the important thing. So I thought, um, of ways I could convey that in my own life. Mm -hmm. And I originally, started going live on Facebook and I started, you know, communicating with my friends. It's, and it was actually right after I, I went to the hospital that I was, um, I was kind of inspired to update everyone on what was going on. And then it started to reach more of a topic that people could relate to like love or like loss or things. And I noticed that the more I put out, the more people wanted to hear my perspective on things. And it made me feel like, maybe my say matters in this world. Like maybe people care about what I have to say or, um, you know, things like that. And it's, it's like, I want to know what I have to say because I'm in a point where I'm getting better and I'm distinguishing my mental health voice and my Taylor voice. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a really awesome way of sharing that and saying, you know, we, we're all, every human body is a body of knowledge this whole separate entity of knowledge. And if I can learn from you and you can learn from me and we can just gain from each other, where, where could we go wrong? Yeah. And that's just my way of saying, you know, this is my open heart to the world saying that I struggle and I know you struggle and our struggles may be 
totally different, but I acknowledge you and I validate you and you're going to get through it. And so am I. Yeah, absolutely. The first thing it makes me think of is um, one of the mantras that I told myself um, for years and years and years. And it's the more that I talk about it, the less power it has over for me, over me. So the more that I talk about my sexual trauma, the less power it has over me. The more that I talk about my dysfunctional relationship with my parents, the less power it has over me. Right. Um, the more that I talk about my mental health, the less power it has over me. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that I thought of is um, there's this thing. That, do you know who Rebecca Campbell is? She's a writer. No, no, I don't actually. Okay. So she's written a couple books, um, and she is incredibly inspirational. She writes about light work, um, which is basically like connecting to a universal energy um, and recognizing that energy in all of us as beings. Um, she also writes about how like the age of the patriarchy is over and we're coming into a new age of feminism. Um, and it's, it's, it's just really interesting. But so one of the things that she writes about is that when one woman heals herself, she helps other women heal themselves. So like as a collective, when I work on myself, I'm healing the community as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I always thought that was really beautiful. And because I know for me, when I was going through a lot of my own mental health stuff, um, one of the big things would come up was like, I'm not worth it, right? I'm not worth like self care. I'm not worth like taking the time out for a bubble bath. Like I can't do anything but get out of bed. And so the idea that when we heal ourselves, we're healing other women, that's honestly what really gives me the strength to take care of myself nine times out of 10. Right. I feel like when women, we put so much into this world, we've put, you know, so many great formulas and so many great, um, you know, artwork and music and so many amazing things. Like we put people into this world, like how much cooler can it get than that? Right. Um, and to put ourselves into that world, I think is such, we, is such an asset to everyone. I mean, I wrote this poem about shrinking about how I I met these women that were dwindling and if if they had just I don't know how to word this but just shrinking down because for the longest time even I as a young girl felt like I had to shrink down to make room for boys to make room for somebody to take charge and it's kind of now just now at 18 occurring to me why can't I be that person yeah why, why can't I take charge of my life I remember when I was going through trauma, I would lay in bed and quite literally hope someone would come up to my window and save me mm -hmm. because that's what I was, you know, shown like the fairy tales and the, and the Barbie and the princess. And why, I just want to, I want to be more than that. I want to be that, you know, Joan of Arc when everyone else is Cinderella. And that's just my personality, I guess. I, I think about it. And I think we as women need to build each other up from the ground up because we cannot build this beautiful, this beautiful home for women of the future if we can't even establish a foundation, you know? So I do this thing where I'll go up to like random women in public and I'll just compliment them. Mm -hmm. You know, why not? Why, it's not going to hurt anybody. If they think yeah. I'm flirting, they're okay. But, you know, it's just, it's this great thing that we have the power to do with our words. We can we can just shape someone's day and that's what's that's what's beautiful about it mm -hmm. and that's why I even resorted back to writing because words just have so much power and if we can use them in the right way then so yeah, yeah I just I think that's great yeah we I think that we are both very much so in the business of raising women up. Um, oh, yeah. and I think that that's something that a lot of people are just now learning, um, how to raise other women up rather than, you know, being judgmental or envious or, um, 
you know, any kind, like putting them down. Like I see so many women putting other women down or making fun of them. And it's just, that's not what we're here for, you know, especially in this day and age with everything going on in the world. Like we need to raise each other up. We need to raise each other up. And that's part of why I'm doing these interviews because I'm getting to meet incredibly amazing people like yourself because Taylor, you are so strong and articulate and such a survivor and and it's just so beautiful to be able to help other women oh yeah definitely I mean I think about if I ever become a mom I would want someone to help my daughter Mm -hmm. you know I want like I'm that person that you know even my mom was like growing up like even in high school she's like does anyone need a ride home Mm -hmm. I don't want girls walking home alone yeah and I I, in part that it's really sad that we have to think that way Mm -hmm. but at least we have people that will say just get come on like I'll just I'll take care of you like I'll care for you because we need to we need to look out for each other in this world I really absolutely um Um, mm -hmm. go ahead I was gonna say and I was fortunate enough to be raised from a strong line of women and I just, I couldn't be more grateful for that. I really couldn't. Yeah, that's, that's definitely very helpful. I, um, I I didn't have that kind of experience. I, I grew up very much in a home where women did the child rearing and the domesticity and they didn't really do anything else. Um, so I, it's, it's amazing that you can be able to, grow in the midst of a of a line of strong women that's that's incredible yeah I mean my mom was a single mom we were in a one-bedroom apartment and she worked the night shift to make it work because Mm -hmm. that's what we had and you know we often joke around now that our little apartment was like a shoebox but it was a shoebox full of love and and that's that's what we needed and that's what we got and we were happy yeah absolutely Absolutely. Taylor, what is um, the name of your blog? It's called Taylor Talks MH. Okay. And what's the URL? Uh, Taylor, www.obviously, uh, not obviously, but Taylor Talks MH.wordpress.com. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, and your, the blog is amazing. It's, it's really incredible the way that you're reaching out and talking about your mental health and being so candid and vulnerable because the world needs that so so much right now we do and i actually wrote in one of my blog posts one of the lines said i let go of my shield of shame Mm. and it was like i i thought about that and i was like how many other people can relate to that yeah how many people are letting this well what if this person thinks that about me well then that's not the type of person you need in your life you move on yeah and it's so much easier said than done. I'm not trying to say, oh, yeah, I just, you know, kick people out of your life, like, like, you know, pulling teeth out, you know, it's, it's just, it's something that I had to do, um, you know, growing up with a father that was an addict, I actually had to, you know, remove him from my life. And that was really difficult. Um, and it's always difficult when you're in it. And I feel like that's something that's universal with mental health. And I'm sure with many other things that it really, really sucks when you're in it. But once you kind of take a step back and you look at it in this whole perspective and you say, you know, this is, this may have felt awful in the moment, but this is what I needed. Yeah. You know, bettering me. Absolutely. And we all let go of our shield of shame. And once we feel like we're in a world where mental health is something that we don't have to be ashamed of, or we feel we don't have to be ashamed of, then that can just open so many doors doors of people getting help you know when I was in my my program for eating disorders I was with women that were a lot a lot older than me and Mm -hmm. a lot of them before entering this program didn't even know that programs like this existed right so a lot of it has to do with raising awareness and talking about it because if like Emma Watson says if not me who if not now when you know Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Taylor. I really, really appreciate you coming on here and and speaking so candidly with me and being so vulnerable and talking about this. Um, I think think that you're going to help 
an amazing amount of women. And I'm so, so, so excited to see what you do because I know your journey is just starting and I'm so excited to see what the future holds for you. Thank you so much. I will definitely keep you posted. Absolutely. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Okay. You too. Thanks so much. Sure thing. Thanks, Taylor.